I'm Guillermo Pierres. I'm a professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine and the president for medicine and science for the American Diabetes Association. And today is a real pleasure for me to discuss with you the impact of inpatient hyperglycemia on surgical outcomes. I will first present to you a brief description on what is the association between perioperative hyperglycemia and outcomes. And we concentrate where the new guidelines will tell us how to manage patients prior to admission, during surgery, and after the operation, the patient go or to the ICU or non-ICU, and discuss about technology, the use of CGM. So there are a large number of studies like this uh, that shows that hyperglycemia or diabetes are associated with poor outcome. This is data on 3,200 non-cardiac surgery patients at Emory University. In yellow are patients with diabetes, in red, patients with no diabetes. And what you see is that in those patients with diabetes and hyperglycemia have an increased risk of pneumonia, wound infection, sepsis, UTI, acute myocardial infarction, acute renal failure, and death. The same thing is that diabetes or hyperglycemia is important, not only in patients with diabetes, but those without diabetes. Plus, let's look at this data. To the, this is data in 11,000 11, patients that underwent colorectal and bariatric surgery. About 29% develop hyperglycemia. Here to the left shows patients with diabetes in red blood glucose where the 180 or 10 mL of mole, and in yellow, less than 180. And in patients with diabetes, the presence of hyperglycemia, similar to the previous study, was associated with increased mortality, infections. The, the presence of hyperglycemia or stress-related hyperglycemia in patients with no history of diabetes is associated with even worse outcome, even compared to patients with diabetes. Look at here, the hospital death much higher, mortality, infection, reoperation significantly higher. This data indicates that hyperglycemia is important in both patients with or without diabetes. And data like this from our group in 55,000 patients showed that increasing blood glucose concentration, and here you have increased a composite for complications rate that included, included pneumonia, acute kidney injury, respiratory failure, acute MI, bacteremia, and death. But Hyperglycemia per se is not the cause. It favors the appearance of complications. Hyperglycemia is a marker of poor outcome. It's not the primary event because there are patients with normal blood glucose who still have complications. So nevertheless, the data will indicate that hyperglycemia is important. It is a good marker of poor outcome and is associated with significant increased complications and mortality. So how we should manage? First, let's talk about prior to admission. Then we go to intraoperative, ICU, non-ICU. So this is an inter, this is our protocol at Emory University. In the top is medication use, diabetic medicine use on the day prior to surgery. And in the bottom, medication use on the day of surgery. And you have oral agents, basal insulin, glargin, deromir, deglutec, and NPH or pre-mixed insulin. Let's look at the oral agent prior to admission, the day prior to surgery. We usually give the same dose day of surgery with all the medications. Makes sense. Glargin and Deromir, basal insulin. If the patient is on morning dose, we just give the full dose. But if the patient, like many patients with basal insulin, takes the insulin at bedtime, we cut down the dose by 20%. We give 80% of usual dose, and the day of surgery, we cut down by 20% because the patient is not going to eat. They don't need much insulin. So this the recommendation came from a study that we published now, oh, no, like five years ago, four or five years ago. And what we did is calculate the basal insulin dose and the blood glucose concentration in ambulatory surgical patients with type 2 diabetes. And here you have, if you have blood glucose, if you give 25% of the dose, let's say, you're doing 20 units and you give five units, with most patients still hyperglycemic. If you give full dose, a significant number of these patients develop hypoglycemia. And the same thing happened in the post-operative group. So we came and recommended that for most patients to maintain blood glucose and to prevent hyperglycemia, 
the best dose is given somewhere around 75 to 80 percent of the total daily dose. Cut down the dose to prevent hypoglycemia in these patients. What about the OR? In patients who develop hyperglycemia or stress hyperglycemia, we define this as a glucose greater than 180 or 10 mL of more. If it's less than 10, nothing. If they've not, we start correction doses and we give rapid acting insulin every two to four hours in the OR or in the post-operative period. If the patient has diabetes, of course, we follow our hospital hyperglycemia protocol. What about in the OR? There's very little data. There are data like these retrospective studies. There are several studies. This is an interesting study from Mayo Clinic, 409 patients. They says that if the patient developed hyperglycemia greater than 180 was associated with increased rate of complication, kidney, pulmonary infection, death. They even said that for each 20 milligrams increase of intraoperative blood glucose, just one mil of more, slightly more than 1.1 mil of more, increased the rate of complication by 30%. This was a retrospective analysis. So the same group of investigators published a randomized control trial. One group of 371 patients undergoing cardiac surgery were randomized to a tight glycemic control between 80 to 100 milligrams versus a conventional treatment. The patient was about 10 millimoles or less. The primary outcome was a composite of mortality, wound infection, ventilatory support, cardiac arrhythmia, stroke, renal failure. And yeah, if you intensify glycemic control, you get a better blood glucose concentration. Sorry for the y-axis says here about 100, but there was absolutely no difference in this randomized control trial. If you go from 80 to 110 or less than 180, there was no different length of stay, no different in hospital stay, no difference in mortality. So in the ICU, this is in the OR. What about in the ICU? Again, Tons of retrospective data suggesting that hyperglycemia in the ICU, surgical patient, this is data from Tony Fernari, is associated with increased rate of complications. He says that a blood glucose greater than 200 is associated with twice the length of stay, three times ventilation duration, and several fold mortality rate. Of course, we all remember Dr. Lubin and, his, and her group uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Vanderberg at Lubin and her group uh, shows they, they intensify glycemic control, randomizing patients to 80 to 110 milligrams, so very tight control with average of 103, compared to a blood glucose of 10, 180 to 200 milligrams, with an average blood glucose of 153. Intensive glycemic control was associated with 40% reduction of mortality, bacteremia, use of antibiotic, ventilation, dialysis, prolonged ICU stay. So this study changed the way we treated patients in the, in the 2001 to 2005. Intensified glycemic control was recommended. Unfortunately, there were several randomized control studies all over the world that couldn't reproduce Dr. Vandenberg's findings. And even the NICE sugar trial, that is the largest of the, was 6,000 patients, showed that there was an increased mortality if you try to achieve tight glycemic control, 80 to 110 versus less than 180. And of course, the reason maybe is hypoglycemia, tight glycemic control, 80 to 110, was associated with a six-fold increase in hypoglycemia rate. And those patients who develop hypoglycemia as two to three fold increase in mortality. This led to the American Diabetes Association, endocrine societies, and institutions around the world to not recommend tight glycemic control less than 110. 140 to 180 is recommended for most patients. Acceptable if you have a good institution with low rate of hypoglycemia, 110 to 140. More than 180 was not recommended. So for many years, we went, so the low range is better than the upper range. So, so we did a study that is called glucocalage, in which we said, well, let's work. And 300 and plus patients who underwent cardiac surgery, we randomized to a tight control of 100 to 140, 
or to the upper range of 141 to 180. And similar what has been reported, here you see the rate of complications that including death, wound infection, pneumonia, acute kidney injury, respiratory failure, and major cardiovascular events. Unfortunately, we did not see any difference in tight control 100 to 140, 140 to 180. These have led that for most patients in the ICU, a blood glucose less than 140 to 180 or around 140 to 180 in our hospital, we just want the blood glucose to be less than 180 or 10 mmol during the ICU. What about non-ICU? Surgical patients, there are very few randomized control studies. The recommendations are to use insulin for most patients and oral agents is not generally recommended. And the American Diabetes Association, what it recommends what is called the basal bolus insulin regimen. That means you give a dose of basal and prandial insulin and you do correction. So multiple doses of insulin, which is where this recommendation came from. It came from a study that is called rabbit surgery. We took a couple hundred patients. They were treated with insulin or agent prior to admissions. And we randomized half to receive sliding scales have to receive basal bolus regimen. Of course, the basal bolus regimen had better glycemic control compared to sliding scale insulin. In no questions about. It. And more importantly, not only do you improve glycemic control, but in this patient who presented with a blood glucose, most of them greater than 200, the use of sliding scale was associated with a threefold increase in the rate of complications. Again, wound infection, pneumonia, acute kidney injury, respiratory failure, and bacteremia, especially wound infections and acute kidney injury. So improved glycemic control, this way general surgery patient decreases, reduces the rate of complications. But surgeons don't like this multiple insulin injection, one basal, prandial, correction. So in order to facilitate the care, we and the American Diabetes Association recommend what is called the basal plus. Just keep a single dose of basal, 0.2 to 0.25 units of basal insulin. This could be glargine, deramir, deglute, U300. So somebody like me, somewhere around 20 to 30 units, one shot a day. And if my blood glucose is elevated, you do correction by sliding scales. And if this doesn't work, you move on to basal balls. This recommendation came from studies that we call basal plus. We've got 370 patients, medicine and surgical patients. What you look in here is basal plus versus basal bolus. So one basal or one basal and prandial insulin, no significant difference. In the top is mean blood glucose per day. In the bottom is blood glucose before meals and at bedtime. So my recommendations to you when you manage patients is to start a single dose, 0.2 units, 0.25 units per kilo. If you have an elderly, older adult patient, more than age 65, 70, 75, if somebody has a GFR less than 60, we start on 0.15 units per kilo, and we progress if needed. Well, briefly, what, what about oral agents? Oral agents are not recommended by guidelines, but they're used all around the world. We don't have good randomized control, too many randomized control studies. There is a lot of medicine, but few in surgical patients. One of the very few oral agent studies in surgical patients is called the Lina surgery. We gave linagliptin five milligrams. This is a DPP-4 that is effective in bringing the blood glucose down, has very little adverse events, and works mostly in postprandial. And we compare linagliptin one tablet a day in general surgery patients with type two, and we gave 0.4 or 0.5 units the basal bolus approach that I mentioned before. And both groups received correction doses for per sliding scales. And here's the data. So linagliptin resulted in similar mean daily blood glucose compared to basal bolus. But there is a catch. Look at the blood glucose. If you have somebody with a blood glucose less than 200, especially if it's less than 180, Linagliptin DPP-4 work extremely well. 63% have blood glucose less than, and this is four universities in the United States. But if the blood glucose greater than 200, please don't use oral agents. Oral agents work for mild hyperglycemia. If somebody has glucose greater than 200, 
please use insulin. Of course, in this status, linagliptin was associated with less hypoglycemia. Finally, what about sliding scale? Guidelines have recommended against sliding scale for decades, but continues to use. In a study in the United States, 40% are treated with sliding scale. So we just analyzed our data in 25,000 patients and tried to make sense who can slide, but why does, why do many people use sliding scales? Because it works if the patient has mild hyperglycemia. Look, if somebody is a needle with glucose less than 140, sliding scales work well. 96% of patients had a blood glucose less than 10 mil more. If the blood glucose less than 180, 140 to 180, 87% did well. But if somebody has severe hyperglycemia, or look at here, more than 250, only 20% respond. So you can use sliding scale in very mild hyperglycemia. So we just, this data on oral agent sliding scales and basal insulin have led us to the concept that we need to individualize treatment in non-ICU patients with type 2 diabetes. If you have a patient with mild hyperglycemia, mild, less than 200, 10 mil of more, 11 mil of more, you can treat them with sliding scales with oral agents alone or combination of them, especially if they're insulin naive. If the patient had a glucose between two and 300, hemoglobin one c 75, 9% who had been taking insulin prior to admission. My favorite is called the basal plus, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 units per kilo with corrections. You can use also basal plus oral agent, DPP-4. And we now recommend basal bolus for those patients who come with very high insulin dose, low glucose greater than 15, 20 mil, mil of mole or 300 milligrams who have been on a very complex regimen prior to admissions. Individualization of care is important in medicine and surgical patients in the hospital. So final, what about CGM? There are two randomized, two factory calibrated uh, uh, CGM. One is the ABO the, the, and the other is the DESCOM. We have done studies with both of them. This shows the Libre Pro Flash CGM, but a very good correlation with point of care testing and CGM. CGM reads about 10 to 12 milligrams lower. So about 0.5 mil of mole lower. But the beauty of CGM is that reach 24 seven. So we do finger sticks before meals and at bedtime. So between 9, 10 p.m. to 5 p.m. there is no blood glucose. But if you look at the rate of hypoglycemic events, especially nocturnal hypoglycemia, is significant recognized with CGM. This was the Libre Pro. We just published this data in diabetes care, and this is the DESCOM G6, the, the comparison. And the correlation between point of care testing, finger sticks with CGM is 98.6%. We right now are doing studies mandated by the FDA to look with the laboratory to see the correlation of CGM. The other thing that we have been able to advance is to transmit the data from the CGM, of course, in the abdomen, in the arm, you have here the sensor, the transmitter to a receiver and directly to the nurse's station. And we have now in the nurse's station, the same that cardiology have called to monitor. Now we have a glucose, what we call the hospital glucose profile. And here you have a patient that you place the CGM day one, day two, and day three, and you follow this patient on a daily basis. So this patient looks like he's high before and after meal. So this is somebody that I will add more basal and more prandial insulin or increase the dose of basal. Here slightly increase the dose of basal. You get the mean blood glucose, the inpatient range, the low, the highs, and glycemic variability. And using the CGM, what we call the hospital glucose profile, we just reported that you can reduce the number of events, the hypoglycemic events, because now we have alarms. So, and here is the percentage of time below range. We are doing this studies with CGM, especially now with COVID, to see if we can reduce the number of hypoglycemic events. I know this has been a very short presentation. We only have 20 minutes. 
that I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this important topic with you. Thank you so much.